Hey, what's going on everyone? I hope this video finds you well. My name is Jonathan Riddell and today we are going to make a bit of a fun video. I'm going to explain my research at five different levels. Uh, in all cases, I'll try to do this explanation as if it uh, was somehow during a casual conversation, uh, but spoiler alert, I'm a little bad at this in person, uh, so hopefully this will be at least marginally better. Before I start my explanation, um, I definitely love to read your explanations at five different levels in the comment sections if you'd like to give this a try. So you and I live in sort of a middle ground of sizes. When we look around, our city or town might seem really big. And if we zoom out a little bit, our country or continent seems almost unimaginably big. But if we zoom out again, we find these things are actually, you know, quite small compared to our planet. But Earth is a part of an even bigger structure, the solar system. The sun, for example, could fit over a million Earths inside of it. And we could go even farther uh, to the size of galaxies or clusters of galaxies or even the entire universe. But you get the point, right? From this perspective, we are actually quite small. But from another perspective, we are actually quite big. A human, for example, is made up of trillions of cells. That's a number with 12 zeros following it. That number is incredibly large, but to cells, an individual atom made up of electrons and protons and neutrons is even uh, smaller than a cell is to a human. For example, there are a hundred trillion atoms, or approximately, in a single cell. So from this perspective, we are actually quite big. Now the interesting thing about everyday life is that you don't have to worry at all about what an individual atom or electron is doing, or even a small group of them. When we walk around every day, we don't have to care about what our smaller parts are doing. We can live life at our size. We use our computers, boil our water, drive our cars without much of a second thought. But all the things I just mentioned, the atoms are doing something, of course. And somehow, if we start by zooming in at one atom, uh, and zoom out to a group of maybe 10 atoms, and then to a group of 100 atoms, and so on, eventually we arrive at our simple human level experience. And that's what I work on, this process of going from the small to the life-size things we experience. When you think of physics, you might think of equations about velocity, distance, time, and acceleration. Or maybe you'll even think about Newton's laws of motion, like the second law, force is equal to mass times acceleration. But these things are really cool, of course. We can look at a situation, assuming it's simple enough to track, and we can make predictions about the future and its past. Now you might have even heard of things like entropy or electrical conductivity, or even more simple things like temperature and pressure. Pressure is easy enough to relate to Newton's laws, it's just the force divided by the area it's applied to. But what about entropy and temperature? Where are these in Newton's laws of motion? Well, they just aren't there. They are emergent properties of systems of many particles. So the fields that help us understand this disconnect are called thermodynamics and a little bit more intimidatingly, uh, statistical mechanics. These fields also help us understand things like materials. Think of conductors and insulators and car engines and, and so on. These fields help us understand things like phase transitions. Think about like water uh, to ice. So really, most technologies, from computers to power plants to the material we build rockets out of, are heavily informed by thermodynamics and statistical mechanics. In modern times, we are really interested in making technology smaller and smaller, and this changes the physics a little bit. You might have heard of quantum mechanics, which tells us how physics works on a very small scale. Think of individual electrons or atoms. As we make things smaller and smaller, we can rely less and less on Newton's laws, and we have to start relying on quantum mechanics instead to tell us what's happening. So what I do is, is I study questions about materials, like metals, using quantum mechanics, and the tools developed by earlier generations of physicists uh, in the fields of thermodynamics and statistical mechanics. 
So throughout most of your courses in your undergraduate degree, you regularly study few body problems. And this, of course, has a lot of value. It illuminates the power of physics and breaks down problems into its simplest parts. But as we start to describe more than just individual bodies or particles, the problems themselves become much harder in general. By three particles, unless your problem is really constrained, you might start uh, using computational methods to solve this problem. In fact, you might have to. But this approach sort of has a disconnect from what we observe in everyday life, right? I don't really think about the initial conditions of each water molecule before I boil a pot of water, apart from maybe the fact that my water currently isn't hot enough. In thermodynamics, we sort of take the macroscopic picture that we're used to for granted, and we just assume there is this thing called entropy and this thing called temperature, and if they're defined appropriately, we can solve problems using the laws of thermodynamics. We do this through a macroscopic picture, ignoring the microscopic details uh, and the underlying physics. Statistical mechanics bridges this gap in some sense and allows us to port microscopic physics to macroscopic physics. Statistical mechanics gives us some really robust tools to study materials, and in both the classical and quantum context has been used successfully for decades. If that sounds interesting, I definitely recommend a class in condensed matter physics, for example. But anyway, despite that success, there's still a number of open questions about why statistical mechanics work so well in the quantum setting. A part of my research is using existing techniques to understand new materials uh, in the condensed matter context. So using quantum statistical mechanics with the desire to understand new material properties and phase transitions. But my big passion lies in understanding why statistical mechanics works so well. So the big foundational questions like when and why does thermodynamic equilibrium emerge and can we understand the time scales associated with this process? So when you took your courses on statistical mechanics, the methods and techniques you were taught about are usually justified in the early chapters of your textbook, usually by some assumption on the dynamics of the system, like ergodicity. It turns out that if we start in a purely quantum setting, we can do a bit better than this, and there is still active and open questions related to the foundations of statistical mechanics. So let's say, for example, that I give you some system, and that system is described by some quantum pure state. And that quantum pure state is not in equilibrium, it is not an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. So the question that I'm interested in more or less uh, can be summarized as in how does this process of going to equilibrium happen? That is, why does a description uh, given to us by statistical mechanics work in the long run for the equilibrium state? There's a lot of work in progress on this question, uh, but still a large class of open problems. For example, we know that a sufficient condition for static equilibrium to emerge for some observable is associated with how many energy eigenstates participate in the dynamics. But how long does this process take? That's a pretty open question right now. But of course, there's been some progress. Another question you might ask is why does equilibrium look like statistical mechanics? Well, that seems to be related to some variant of the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, which tells you your expectation values of local observables in the energy eigenkets, I know this is a mouthful, already look locally thermal. The statements of eigenstate thermalization can vary, but it usually boils down boils down to, uh, do all of the eigenstates behave like this, or is it only most of them? So it's like the strong statement and the weak statement. You can also get into situations where your dynamics have integrals of motion, uh, and you need to generalize the hypothesis. So there's a lot of nuance to these questions, of course, uh, but that's where my big interests lie.
So since I have a number of projects, I'll just focus on one here for the sake of simplicity. Recently, my collaborators and I have made progress predicting equilibration in finite time uh, for a number of different types of correlation functions. This is, of course, uh, really interesting on its own, but the big question we'd like to answer is equilibration in finite time for pure states in isolated quantum many body systems. This is, of course, really hard. Uh, it boils down to bounding sums of complex numbers uh, with different magnitudes and whose phases are time dependent. So the hope is that we can relate the dynamics of certain classes of pure states to correlation functions, uh, which we have better understanding of and, of course, more analytical control of. So that's it for today. I hope you liked the video. If you did, feel free to like, subscribe, and leave a comment below.